Uh, so it gives me great uh, sense of satisfaction to be able to introduce Adira today. Um, and Adira has uh, been a master's student who is about to complete her uh, course at the Royal College of Art. And Adira worked with the Institute of Public Health uh, and our local program in um, the Northeast of India, of which we have se uh, set up a collaborative called Seed Hub, a Seed Lab. And I will come to that a bit later. But Adira has worked with people uh, from the Northeast, with researchers from Institute of Public Health and an embedded program to think about snake bite management, a very important topic, uh, not only for the Northeast of India, but also for all forest areas um, across India, given that there are lots of hidden deaths that happen with respect to snake bite. Um, so I'd like to welcome Adira today, and I'd also like to congratulate her for a very um, thorough uh, project, which has been enabled by a lot of people uh, from the ground, and I hope that she can take us uh, through that journey. So over to you, Adira. Hmm. Okay. Um, thank you, Nandini. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Adira, and I am a designer. Uh, as Nandini said, I just finished my master's course at the Royal College of Art and Imperial College London. Um, I'm going to be taking you through uh, a little bit about the kind of work I do to set the context for what you can expect from this project. And I'll share what the project is, how it was made, and who the people were that helped bring this to life. I will primarily be talking in English and I'll switch to Hindi in between. If there are some design terminologies that you think are interesting and you want to know a little bit more about, uh, please do make a note of it. And I'm happy to discuss that in the Q&A. And um, I'll go through the presentation now and we can come to the Q&A once this is done. Okay, so to begin with, I have a teaching diploma from the National Institute of Fine Arts, and after which I did my Bachelor of Design at Shrishti Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Bangalore. And now I have just completed my master's at the Royal College of Art and Imperial College London. I have had a very uh, mixed um, interdisciplinary design practice. So I started off as a botanical painter where I focused on portraiture and still life and nature study, after which I studied communication design and information arts, which helped me shift my work to being an illustrator. And in the professional space, I've worked in policy, social welfare and conservation, always in the capacity of a designer. And now in the last two years, I've explored a lot more with sustainability, circular design, systems thinking, ethnography, and that's helped me round my practice to make it more holistic. So this is a little bit about the context of the kind of work I've done. To help visualize this, um, this is a piece of um, illustration that I did for a tree and biome <clears throat> in Bangalore. This is a gray headed swamp pen. So my work has looked like this. It also has looked like this. I worked at Nature Conservation Foundation as part of the education and public engagement program. Um, and I also designed a lot of policy briefs for the accountability initiative at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. And this is my vision statement, which is something that um, we create as designers um, in this master's program. And I wanted to share it because I thought it would help understand the constant theme and the kind of work that I do. So I aim to create purposeful design interventions that facilitate discourse on human ecology, urban well-being, and climate activism to help people build enduring relationships with their environment. My goal is to use different topics like science, wildlife biology, zoology, public health, things and challenges that people face in their everyday life and use design to kind of bring those challenges to life and like address how people can either look at it differently, help them problem solve these different aspects of their life and so on. Oh, sorry. 
So this particular project that I'm talking about today is called Biu Tabu Nibu. And this literally translates to snake, snake, snake um, in English. This project has been conducted in collaboration with the Institute of Public Health in India with Grantham Institute, which is an organization in the UK and Green Hub, um, which has played a huge role as a local host for the project in the Northeast. And the overview of this project is that it's an edu info game for children from indigenous groups of Akka, Nishi and Miji about snake bite management in Northeast India. This project looks at One Health and human wildlife conflict and it uses frugal innovation, which we also call jugar in a way in India, where you use very local material to create um, something that's playful and brings people together through community engagement. So the context and opportunity for this project came when I started uh, talking to Prashant and Nandini, who have been very important in bringing all of this work to life. And this project uses participatory design to create educational access for human wildlife conflict amongst indigenous groups. So just to explain these keywords a bit, um, I think the word art and design itself are, uh, you can debate what they mean and people are constantly talking about what is art and what is design. When I'm talking about design in this particular presentation, I'm referring to the problem solving capacity of something that is creative. So here art is something that is beautiful visually and design would be something that helps people um, understand a challenge that they are facing a bit better. Participatory design looks at involving people, the users and stakeholders at each stage of the project to make sure that the outcome at the end of the project that comes out of it is very contextual, is something that is usable, is something that people can relate with, and it has that real life value. So it's not something that is alien. A lot of the times what happens is when you design something, you design it in this vacuum of just a studio or a company. And when it is tested in the real world, it doesn't have that same application that you thought it would. So participatory design helps overcome that by involving people in the conversation from the very beginning. And these are some images of the project base. It was conducted in um, Northeast India, specifically looking at Pakke Tiger Reserve. And here are some images from my field research. Um, here you can see Rambia Sir from the Forest Department uh, rescuing an Indo-Chinese rat snake and Ashok who played a very important role in bringing all of this work to life. This is just a video that shows the different elements of this game. I'm going to talk about this in a little more detail, but I wanted to give everybody a visual reference of what it looks like. So those were the different components of the physical game. It consists of 10 playing mats that are made using bamboo and cane and cloth and a deck of playing cards that talk about uh, different scenarios and uh, snakes uh, in terms of scenario building and snake bite management issues. And it contains also a dice, which is made of plywood. And the dice itself is shaped in this way so that when you roll it onto the mat, it falls exactly on one of those patterned holes. And that helps determine the kind of card you get. So this game basically uses these um, elements of play, community engagement, and scenario building to help children learn about what they can do when they are ever in a situation of having one of their friends been like bitten by a snake or when they see somebody who is in danger or somebody who is potentially in a position to cause danger to the snake itself because this relationship is, it goes two ways. Um, the scenario cards themselves have come from interviews, questions and workshops that I've conducted. I'll talk about this a little bit more in my research. And this content has been designed in collaboration with Shraddha Rathor and she's here in the Zoom call so maybe we can get her input in the Q&A as well. 
um, to kind of bring to life the context and the wildlife science of this particular environment. So the making of this has been done by, like I said, these interviews and workshops. This on the left is an image from a needs assessment workshop that was done at Lower Bhalukpong Government School. And on the right is an image of co-design um, sessions with Mahesh using cloth and cane. So what this basically means is that um, when you're designing something as a designer leading the project, you draw on uh, information from both primary and secondary sources. Information that comes from primary sources is crucial because it helps you understand what exactly the people need and why they need it to exist in a very particular way. So on the left hand side, as you can see, this was a collaboration that helped me understand the kind of content that needed to exist. What are the situations that children are facing there? What kind of scenarios do they actually encounter when they go out into their environment? And how can that be addressed through a very playful interaction? And on the right, you can see there is a simultaneous co-design workshop that's happening to determine how this form can exist. And these happen side by side because it's equally important to take into consideration not just the content but the way that it's being made because a lot of the times what ends up happening is when we're designing something we spend a lot more time thinking about what the material is but it's it's equally important to think about how that material can be brought to life because otherwise the content just doesn't get through to the end group so the approach and overarching aim of this project has been to look at One Health, which is something that I know is currently a very popular topic in the wildlife space. And it looks at human health, animal health, and ecosystem health, and the unity between all three of these factors. And this project looks at just this one topic of One Health, which is human wildlife conflict of snake bites. And it uses this design of this game to address the key species and challenges that are being faced, the ecological value of the species, the cultural value of the species, and the myths that are propagated. So I know that a lot of the participants in this seminar currently are public health researchers and wildlife biologists. And um, I myself am not like someone who's an expert in epidemiology and wildlife science. So this project has been focused on the biophysical and the cultural um, side of wildlife more than the science of it itself. So the way that the research study was designed was uh, by conducting ethnographic research. And ethnography is something that looks at understanding the lived experience of a particular place. And this was broken down into 11 semi-structured interviews with various stakeholders. Uh, such as educators, research fellows, forest department, and field biologists, as well as conducting two workshops with 40 students to understand community beliefs regarding species through storytelling and to understand perceptions and responses to threatening species through writing. So here you can see I worked with a range of stakeholders to understand what was happening from different perspectives. It was important to work with people in the space of education and uh, research to understand what material exists out there, how are children being taught in schools, um, what is the format that they learn in, is that format effective, can it be changed, does it need to be changed, and working with the forest department and uh, field biologists helped me understand what exactly are those environmental challenges that people face? And there's a difference here because a lot of the times the environment that we live in is not reflected in the material that we learn in school. And especially for children who live in very close contact with nature and in biodiversity hotspots, it's really important to understand that particular context and understand how they can learn more about that place. So this project focuses on bringing to life this very uh, place-based education system. So to talk a little bit more about ethnography and participatory design, here is footage, uh, and this was taken by Ashok at Green Hub uh, for the snake rescue mission at Parque Tiger Reserve. 
and on the right you can see uh, interview snapshots of Manisha, Subhum, Shikha, and Veena from Green Hub. Uh, so this is just a visual reference of the place, um, of the kind of environment that exists there, and these interviews that I conducted. And from the workshop, I got these samples of uh, challenges that children were facing with human wildlife conflict. And this is what helped me choose snake bite as the issue to focus on in this particular project. Because of this needs assessment that was done, I understood that out of all the species that exist there for these 40 students, the one that recurred most was that of snake and that really helped me understand how to um, address the current needs of the students so on the left are samples of written accounts of experiences and encounters and above is a book that's the first documentation of snakes in Parque tiger reserve and it takes into account the local names encounters of three tribal languages Mishi, Akai, and Miji and this collection of material helped me uh, understand what was needed to be designed. The way that all of this data was analyzed was through ethnographic research and quantitative and qualitative data. So when you're conducting these workshops, um, you get samples of interviews that are either video or audio files. And from the students, I got these written documents. I also got um, a lot of um, in-person content where people were saying something in a group setting and I was taking notes. So the way that I analyzed this data is from the drawings. I created this tabular comparison of what people said, their age, class, tribe, school, what the dislike species was, and the details of dislike species. So this helped me understand what exactly the context of these encounters included. And for the interviews, which were both video and audio files, I transcribed them uh, using a uh, software. And from here, I used thematic analysis very loosely, which thematic analysis is a way to um, analyze qualitative data. Here you look at the keywords that occur, the number of times that they occur, and find those common themes that uh, emerge from what people have said and understand why they have said it. So all of this research led to identification of pain points. And this is a problem wheel that I created for this area of human wildlife conflict. And it's based on insights generated from interviews with Green Hub Fellows. Uh, so this comes, this has come from my primary research. And here you have elements of in the first circle, game design, data, research, policy, workshop, product, workshop again. The first circle represents the kind of way this challenge can be tackled. The second circle looks at who these stakeholders are. So stakeholders can be people who are part of the problem, part of the issue, and also are impacted by it. And the outermost circle looks at the content or the context. So what is the problem? The inner circle is who does that problem involve? And the, more, the innermost circle is how can that problem be addressed? And design can exist in very many different ways. Uh, when you look at the space of research and policy, design primarily is used for publications, for reports, for briefs. And over there, it plays the role of communicating information effectively to policymakers and the ministry. In terms of games, design is used to create something that is playful and creative and something that children enjoy using. For workshops, design is used, for example, to create uh, an atmosphere that is engaging, where people feel safe and they feel like they can share their experiences. So these are just examples that I'm sharing right now. But out of all of these, for this particular issue of snake bite management, that looked at the lack of place-based education, I found there was a lack of species identification. There was a lack of anti-venom profiling, a lack of anti-venom in hospitals and so on. And I chose to focus on this one slice that looked at the lack of place-based education involving children and educators and done using game design. 
And now I want to share a little bit about community engagement and indigenous games. So when you're designing something, um, it's something that plays a really big part about how you end up addressing this issue is looking at existing work that has been done in the space. So these are models that have come from case studies that were conducted in Sarawak in West Borneo. And they look at how indigenous community knowledge and knowledge shared in schools um, has a gap in between and how that gap can be filled by co-creation where you bring the children in to the way that it can exist, the way that design can exist. And you use play and learning to build that space of co-creation. And co-creation means that you as a designer are then leading or facilitating those workshops and those needs assessment activities to understand how those children see something, how their perspective can be brought into the picture. And the second diagram here is a breakdown of the different stages. So here the first stage is empathy, after that define, ideate, prototype, test. So these are the different stages that I followed in this design process, where first you identify the problem, you identify the situation that needs to be addressed, you scope it out so you're able to define it. You come up with different ideas, like I showed you the problem wheel, and you prototype solutions and you test them. And you this is a process that doesn't happen in this very linear way. This is something that is a back and forth. You move from one stage to the next, sometimes you come back to the previous stage. And that is something that's a very uh, standard part of designing for people. You have to constantly try different things, see which thing works the best, and then keep refining that until you reach that finished product. And all of these things that I've shared with you before filtered into this overarching double diamond so in design research, we use a lot of different models to hold the research in place. One of these is this particular one on this slide called the double diamond. And it looks at how you can apply this to any social or cultural situation where you have different stages of discovery, define, develop, and deliver. And then you, you break this down. This is broken down into developing the context, into working with different stakeholders, using different methods, ideating, um, mapping out the concept with specialists, co-design workshops. And then you go to field and you test. And this is something that was a really important part of this project because I was working with this concept of snake bite management in Northeast India, something that is... Um, well, to begin with, A, we don't have enough data that records the depth of the issue currently, but then how can we use current experiences of people? And when you're working with limited data in a very local specific place, it's, it, it, it's really important to conduct a breadth of research to understand how far does the issue go? Who all does it involve? So this is an example of how if design is at the core of an outreach project, how it can hold the project in place. The way this game has been evaluated has been in parts because like I said, in participatory design, you involve the users and stakeholders at each stage of the development process. So this means that whatever you're designing or making is constantly being tested. So I started this entire project with an idea and a concept. And I, when I researched and I got all of the data from the interviews, I decided to focus on snake bites. And I made low fidelity prototypes. So low fidelity prototypes, as you can see in the first image on the left, are those which are made using very basic material. So here the focus is not to create something that is beautiful or something that is visually appealing and something that people love looking at or enjoy. The focus is to see if the information that needs to be communicated is being communicated well. And that's why it's important to understand which material would also work best. So here I used cloth and masking tape to make these very low fidelity models. And I tested with these with the children. So for, I first um, played this game with Ashok, Ethel, and Arjun from Greenhub. 
to see if they could help me facilitate the workshop and then i took this to two different schools in pakke in and around pakke and i played these games with the children to understand how they were experiencing this game and the way that i was gaining this feedback was here at the top you can see these different diagrams where i was using multiple choice questions to see which game they like best i was using child friendly likert skills to see which game people were drawn to and why and for the facilitators i was using a model of human centered learning which looks at how something can be broken down into practical contextual and um application elements and trying to understand how these different games work one when placed against each other so another really important part of social impact work in india is the way that it's measured and the way that impact can be assessed it's very difficult to find the right way every time i think that's definitely a challenge i have also faced in my professional work in india but when you can identify the people and the way the people communicate you can adapt these models so adapting the models is something that is very important because that helps you get the best possible feedback for this particular game and once you have this feedback you can then take these low fidelity prototypes and then convert it into a high fidelity prototype so if a low fidelity prototype is something that is made using basic material a high fidelity one would be something that is um refined then something that is ready to be delivered to the market so these are the different stages of how a product or um a service or a system can be designed and in terms of the feedback for this particular game i worked very closely with nandini and shraddha uh nandini as someone who has been in northeast india and done so much of her work there has a very deep understanding of the contextual needs of the people so her knowledge of the local environment of the network of the schools helped me understand the kind of information that was important to convey and the kind of process that could be used to convey it with shraddha um i was able to understand the wildlife science in these scenario cards so to talk a little bit more about the final um content of the game that emerged i'm going to go back to that now which looks like this um the material here comes from understanding that um this particular environment of northeast india is very culturally rich so then instead of making something with plastic or making something with uh, a material that is foreign i thought it was that much more valuable to make it with local material so that's why it looks like something that can be made there which is something that is a very powerful part of design to create things that people can associate with which is reflected in the material materiality of the project and in terms of the content when i talk about the scenario cards that uh, shraddha helped me design that comes from those experiences that people have had so the content has questions like what would you do if your friend is wearing bangles and she is bitten by a snake what would you do if you're walking and your friend picks up a rock and throws it at a snake what would you do if your friend has been bitten by a snake and a faith healer is called and these are not games that you find in the market because this is a very local application of design so i think the power of this project is in bringing to life the very current issues that children over there face and allowing them to feel like that is important creating tools that help them um address it creating tools that help them understand it and most importantly help them um uh, feel that it's real because a lot of the times we remove that power of design from these pockets of the country which don't have urban life so this has been the overall project and um this is the end of my presentation so i'm going to stop sharing my screen right now and i'm happy to open the floor to question and answers and we can discuss this together
thanks adira uh, vivek should i go ahead yes yeah um so adira there are a couple of uh, very specific questions uh, that in the chat box that uh, i will just read out or if anybody would like to unmute and ask any questions please go ahead um so the first question that we have uh, from anika is with software uh, sorry from meena is with software did you use for transcription so you have uh, a lot more that have come out now uh, and these softwares use ai to decipher what the video and audio content is so i use this uh, model called otter and i can share that link with you in the chat at the end um nandini uh, can i have a follow up question on that yes please go ahead yeah. meena here it was wonderful adira very creative presentation and the project also very creative uh, i was asking about the transcription software because quite often it is very expensive uh, this transcription software uh, so Uh, was the one used by you is free or how it is so uh, because i'm a student um, i get a package of software from my university so for me it's uh, under the education package but um, i know that uh, these different uh, transcription softwares have different systems so if you apply as like an organization then you can get a discounted rate to use the software so i'm also happy to share that link in the chat okay thank you uh we have a question from arjun next arjun go ahead uh yes thanks adira that was a really fascinating talk and it i think really brings to light how such processes can be uh used for wildlife conflict and in general this larger space so i had one uh, specific question which is something that you had alluded to uh which is it helps in the in the snake bite management stuff over a longer terms so i uh, my broader <laughs> question is you know what part of this game did you incorporate i mean where in the game did you incorporate the part <laughs> where the long term implications of snake bite are made salient now you know because snake bite is a low probability but high lethality event which is like lots of wildlife conflict so i'm curious to know what part of that fed into the game so for me i think a lot of the decisions that i was making for this project were coming from existing research but also they were very time bound this particular project currently the way that it exists looks at education at a, at the first level so this looks at that creating that knowledge and awareness at the first level in terms of long term behavior change the impact of that and the the gap that exists between knowledge and behavior is something that would need to be tested multiple times and then that process itself requires a like a longitudinal study to understand what the results are at that stage um so currently the project the way that it exists hasn't reached that place yet but that is definitely something that i thought about at the end as well and i am curious to understand how does something like this reach that particular point because even the sample size of students that i was able to work with is is pretty small so then expanding that testing it multiple times and then gaining feedback about whether that knowledge has filtered in to how many snake killings dropped or how many snake killings or snake bites people reported i think that would require a network of data to be gathered in the long run thank you if okay thanks arjun and thanks adira arjun sorry to put you on the spot but uh, would you like to talk about monte cola oh yeah sure <laughs> so uh monte cola is uh, a snake uh, rescue tool and it's a larger brand for uh, helping reduce snake bite uh, in the, particularly in the northeast but anywhere so it's this really portable and the world's toughest snake hook so you can carry it everywhere because similarly like i've been involved in this space for a while and we've seen that it's really cumbersome to carry the entire snake hook you know um everywhere because it doesn't fit in the bag you're stopped at the airport so we've created this really portable device which can just latch on to anything made of stainless steel so it'll never rust made of 6 mm steel so you can move furniture around which is very important in 
rescue situations, right? When snake enter homes. So yeah, so that's something that's going to be rolled out very soon. It's had its launch at the Green Hub Festival. And then uh, Nandini and Salil also launched it uh, at, uh, at a, one of our brainstorming sessions. And it's going to be out in the market uh, very soon. Thanks. <laughs> Hey, this sounds really cool. I think I had a conversation with Shraddha and she was telling me about this. Yeah. Um, but if you have somewhere, somewhere where I can look at this online, please share a link in the chat. I think for everyone, this will be very interesting. For sure. I will. Yes. Thanks. Oh, he... <laughs> so I zoom. Oh, thanks, God. <laughs> My bag cool. is really the other end of the room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. We have another question from Nayantara. A uh, really cool Arira. Could you give us a concrete example with a visual card, if possible, of how the content of the game corresponds to the science of snake and snake bite management? Would also love to hear a little bit about the gameplay in itself in a little more detail. Okay, so give me one second. I am just going to share a different file. So I'm just pulling it out. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen again. Is this visible? Yes. Okay, so for the content of uh, the cards, the cards are divided into two categories. Um, one is snake identification and the other one is uh, scenarios. So the snake identification cards are those snakes which are most commonly found around Pakke. And this has come from um, the book that uh, Shraddha has written with Rambia sir. And it's come from the um, interviews that I had with uh, stakeholders and the workshops with children. So the way that these cards are uh, done is that they're illustrated uh, to show these different snakes. And I also, just one second, I just want to move to the scenario cards. And the scenario cards are also illustrated, but they have this one visual of the, of like three children coming across the snake. And the questions have come from this engagement of workshops with the children themselves. So this one is, you come across a snake while walking with your friends, what should you do? Then the answer is at the back. And the second one is one of your friends sees a snake and tries to pick up sticks to kill it. So then what would you do? And these questions, then the answer is at the back again. Um, this one is someone's bitten by a snake. You suck out the venom and cut around the bite to release bad blood. Was this the right thing to do? So they these questions have come from either incidents that have happened or um, experiences that children have seen, people around them have. And the card itself consists of um, 30 decks right now. Um, but I'm still trying to figure out if it would be possible to kind of add more or whether this these answers need to be edited and work on revisions for that. Um, this particular scenario looks at should you wear open shoes or closed shoes at night when you leave the house? Um, so again, uh, it looks at prevention and management. So what can you do as a person? um behaviorally when you're going out into into this environment uh just things to keep in mind do's and don'ts and then what can you do if the situation does occur and happens to you um and in terms of the gameplay the way that it works is that if um, you have a dice you roll it onto the mat like i showed in the image and depending on where the dice lands on the mat you have a card that is picked up and you have to answer that card. You play it in two teams, and uh, the team that finishes this course of these 10 mats first wins the game. Thanks, Adira. Uh, we have another question from um, Rohit, and Rohit is at Green Hub uh, today. 
with a bunch of other people who are uh, hearing you. So Rohit had two questions. I might have missed it, but what is the reason for taking interviews of Green Hub alumni? And the second question is, can this be scaled up to other regions or will this work have to be repeated for other regions? So for the first question, um, I was working closely with Nandini and Green Hub was onboarded as a host partner for the project. Um, I personally, I'm, I'm not familiar with Northeast. So for me, it was important to work with people who are familiar with the environment. Green Hub provides that space of bringing together local practitioners to understand wildlife research and uh, video and filmmaking and storytelling. And so I thought that was a really wonderful resource to work with people there, to have these conversations and uh, hear their stories of what have they seen, what have they heard when they've conducted their own research, uh, what has been their experience of growing up in that environment. And this ties in to designing this research study because um, a lot of this on, comes under all of this comes under actually primary research and it's not possible to gain this understanding without bringing these very real experiences into the conversation so this is why green hub fellows were uh, interviewed i was not looking at the segregation of like alumni and current that just ended up being a coincidence of working with people who were available at that time and for your second question sorry nandini what was it so the second question is, can this work be scaled up to other regions or will this work have to be repeated for other regions? Okay, so I think this process can be applied to different regions and different human wildlife conflicts. In terms of repeating it, it will have to be repeated if factors change. So if this game that's designed is now not for children or if it's for children who are older or younger the work will have to be done again to understand what best suits those, that particular user group. If this work is done with people who uh, are with a human wildlife, area of human wildlife conflict, that is not of snakes, then you will have to conduct research to understand what that issue is, what are the problems that people are facing. So part, the approach can remain the same. It can be uh, interviews, workshops, you can follow that methodology in itself in the larger picture, but it will have to be, I would not use the word reworked, I would use the word adapted to what the needs of that place are. And then that, therefore this entire experience would then create the best possible design for this new environment or new problem. Um, thanks, Arira. So I, we have uh, Shraddha who wants to ask the next, next question. Shraddha, could you unmute and ask? Yes, yes. Uh, hi, Arira. Uh, thank you so much for taking us through your journey of coming up with this game because it just looks like a game, but there's so much of science and ethnography that went into it. And uh, I, it was very interesting for me to understand that process. Um, so my question was, you mentioned in one of your slides that uh, there was a gap between the indigenous knowledge and uh, the knowledge that was shared in schools. So with respect to that, uh, what was your experience in bridging this gap? Because I also understand that, you know, when you're trying to convey uh, something, you have to keep uh, cultural appropriateness or, you know, there's a lot of trust building, there's language barriers all these factors come into play. So how, how was it for you to bridge that gap? And if you have any anecdotes to share. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Shraddha. Uh, thank you for the question um, and uh, your contribution to this entire project. So uh, for the gap that exists, I think this is something that I personally also find very interesting. Um, is in that places that are more remote in India, we do not currently have education material that fits the requirements of that place. So when I went to schools, I went to two schools in uh, Assam and Arunachal, Lower Bhalukpong Government School and Ruth Foundation School. 
when I was conducting these workshops, I had images of the wildlife that exists there of different kinds of snakes. And I just printed them out on paper and I was showing them to children and seeing if they had any stories they wanted to share, for example. Um, something that I observed that I found quite interesting was the teachers there were quite surprised and they were quite uh, amused that uh, I was interested in these things because they are considered to be very boring in a way and every day and out of place in the context of education because education in these schools even looks at mainstream education so the kind of things that they would learn would allow the children to have maybe knowledge of an environment that doesn't exist around them um, this is also something that I discovered when I was working at Nature Conservation Foundation with schools in peri-urban Bangalore where children have books about like giraffes and uh, animals that we don't have like in the country forget like that particular environment and they're learning all of this information but then the animals that are outside of their own homes we don't they don't know anything about beyond the fact that they are dangerous they are bad they harm and i think this is the gap that i found again in the northeast and this particular gap was uh it was interesting to have these conversations with teachers to kind of also understand their perspective because it reflects the role of educators as well, where they become just people who transfer this knowledge from books to the people, to the students. And I think with them, allowing them to like bring in fun and play and things that can be learned together, things can that can be done outdoors, things that um aren't restricted to a desk or a table that was also something that was a really big part of bridging this gap and allowing children to learn by having fun and making things together because even in the history of indigenous games uh something that constantly emerges is that they build community resilience they build cooperation they build empathy and i think that itself is a really important part of holistic education for children so this was uh, this has been my discovery of this space. So uh, thanks for that, Arida. We have a follow up question, part of which you answered before, from Kaushik, uh, asking how accessible is this game to school children, and do you think that this game can be generalized uh, to the whole of India? Uh, yeah. So There's currently, a I want to add to that Prashant has also put in a comment where he says and we can bring him up in after you where there is huge potential of this work for addiction related work or NCD work among school children using such approaches okay um, so the way that this game currently exists right now is a single prototype there is just one uh, physical form that I have with me and um, the way, because of the way it's been tested it's been tested with the low fidelity prototypes using cloth the next step in making this accessible to children would be taking this final refined prototype testing it with these 40 students that I onboarded at the beginning of the project gaining their feedback seeing if something needs to be changed the game goes through another round of design iteration and then at the end, what is refined needs to be scaled up. The way that it would have to be scaled up is I would imagine either funding through CSR grants or social innovation research and applying for those kind of um, funding opportunities that would give this work itself a platform. I would also, I think based on the work that I did, understand that this game itself doesn't need to be introduced into the school curriculum because i think this is something that i think is very important is that changing the education system is a whole other conversation what we can do in this current space is bring material that is supplementary or alternative and have these bodies like the forest department that play a really important in this con role in this context of the place have them use it where the forest department can conduct workshops at the planetary health interpretation center people can come there to learn using these very different uh, playful elements. So the positioning of this would be slightly different as well. But how easily accessible it would be would, I think the next step would be to have to find funding to make it possible. Um, 
and yeah should we is i hope i answered that uh we have another question from gora uh who asks what kind of approaches we can adapt in places where different traditional beliefs are associated with snake bites for instance in the galo tribe if a person gets bitten by a snake then the person needs to stay in a community hall called dere for 7 days and the person is not allowed to enter the house so whenever they see a snake they prefer to kill it that's a really interesting question and i think this was one of the most challenging parts of the content that i found um because like this example that is shared if a particular tribal community believes that um when someone's bitten by a snake they call a faith healer uh how do you stop that from happening and another thing that like a follow up question that i had to myself was do you stop it from happening is it your role to stop it from happening because as someone who's coming in to introduce new knowledge into a particular place i think it's equally important as researchers or designers to take into consideration the old knowledge or traditional knowledge that exists there so how it would be done for like how it was done for this particular game is that card that has a faith healer question the answer to that uh, and this is something that i worked with shraddha and nandini on was you first take take the person to the hospital or the person first gets medical care and then whatever the community believes can happen so i as a person i and as a designer i i work in this space of social and cultural uh, challenges and i think that i would not cross that line of trying to change uh, a community's belief because i don't think as an external person who has no knowledge or experience of that i have the right but then i think what we can do in these particular situations is find ways to work around it how can we bring in new ways of thinking and combine them with what the experience of that particular community is what can be done is conversations and workshops with people from this particular community that you mentioned and bring them into the conversation see what they feel what is their feedback when you tell them this how would they communicate it to each other maybe the way they communicate it to each other can be incorporated into the design itself so then it's effective and then it's not something that they feel removes their experience from the conversation completely um so yeah that's my answer it is a very tricky question thanks uh we have a series of questions and comments from prashant of which i'm trying to keep up uh with all of them uh so the <laughs> first one uh, is uh, that it would be nice to hear from nandini or the seed lab on the directions this work is taking in the coming months or years also if the team is willing and if already not done a lot of this must be grouped under commons and open knowledge project a uh, open knowledge project uh, and put up on uh, wikimedia commons of course with the credits and identities of the knowledge stakeholders and he has given a very relevant uh, example um so i will answer that question so the seed lab is a, a multidisciplinary collective of 27 active members so far who are artists researchers uh, working in northeast india in different capacities who have set up five working groups so far focusing on one nature education two is of which adira has presented some work today uh, two is um, science engagement of which um, rohit nandakumar uh, leads a talk series called blah 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 of which any of you who would like to present your work is very welcome to do so and con contact the email address i mentioned and there are other working groups uh, related to understanding elephants um creating site specific work groups like an eagle nest wildlife sanctuary and nagaland and of which we very interestingly we also have a small creative commons working group uh, which is interested in promoting um, assamese wikipedia so uh, we actually have our first creative commons class with green hub fellows this sunday at 8 pm again which will be an uh, which will be an open link done by jolie bora 
And this is a good suggestion where we will try and get some of these commons, uh, some of these projects on Creative Commons, but that is very much in the spirit of what uh, we think and what we want to do. Um, Prashant, would you like to unmute and ask any other questions? I think there is- No, one... not particularly, thank you. Oh. Um, I mean, this is just very uh, fascinating work. Am I, am I audible? My internet yes, might yes. be poor. We can hear you. So um, there's another question. I will ask this to um, Shraddha and Adira. The question is, uh, any comments on the all women led work? Is it so? How do this or in general, the team's genders composition affect such community-based co-production approaches? Sorry, Shraddha, I, would you like to say something? Yeah. Oh, hi, hi. Wow, Nandini, all women team. I think it was fun. Um, uh, can you repeat your question? So the question is, to elaborate. Uh, does the uh, gender team gender composition affect such community-based community, community -based co production uh, approaches? And was this an all women's led work? Oh, was it Adira? Can I? I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's a good question. Um, it was so this because it was my master's project. I was the like the one person at the beginning and at the main center of all of it. Um, I think working with uh, Nandini and Shraddha was incredible they come with a wealth of knowledge and experience and working with women is always uh, wonderful i really do enjoy it the project however had a lot of help from men as well so <laughs> i can't say that it was an all women team uh, it would not have been possible without ashok and it, i don't know if ashok is here still on this call but if he wants to say something that would be amazing. But Ashok uh, Talang, he made a lot of the um, field work possible, a lot of the engagements possible. What I would say is um, the co-production and the collaboration could not have been possible without local leadership. And I think I would emphasize that fact a lot, where a lot of the times we come in as external foreigners or people who aren't from this particular environment that we're trying to create something for and that has very drastic implications on what is at the end designed so this particular project i think the strength of it has come from the very local engagement and that i would say would not have been possible without ashok uh, also nandini i do believe that uh, pake has seen a lot of over the years seen a lot of women participation and uh, that again has so much to do with uh, uh, the kind of environment that's that exists there you know not just with the department it's also the local communities and it's just very comfortable uh, to work there uh, you have so much help from everybody and so much cooperation so it makes it a lot easy and fun uh, to work in that place would you agree adira nandini I would definitely agree as like I was telling Adira, for instance, doing such a short term um, project as part of your ma uh, master's, one of the uh, Pake in that sense is a uh, is a great inclusive ecosystem to be part of and to be a uh, great credit to her to integrate into such systems and embed herself into such systems uh, where at the heart of it, I think, maybe we don't actively ask ourselves, but at least passively, we try to ask what does good participation look like at the heart of what we are doing. And we've also come a long way. I remember seeing photographs of me in the early days, uh, two women with 180 men. And I'm very glad to uh, today that it's uh, much more equal, at least in the pictures and in the diversity that we see. Um, we have... Um, I'll just take the last two questions and uh, we'll then call it a wrap. Um, 
So we have a question. We have a question from Anika and Nina. How would you adapt the game or the approach or any other creative approach to educate and empower adults on topics such as the one you chose? I see the potential of these creative approaches to build public discourse on important issues that matter to our lives. Hence, this question. Okay. So yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, the overall approach of participatory design is, I think, something that is now gaining a lot of momentum in the social space. It's being used by a lot of researchers and small innovation hubs to create these design sprints or these design projects. And there are definitely case studies about how it's applied for like I know that a lot of work has been done in the UK about adolescents and children who are like uh, smoking and how this can be something that can be addressed there. Uh, I was having conversations with Nandini before I focused on snake bite management, where we were also talking about how it can be used for other aspects of people's social lives in Parque. And it is very possible to apply this approach and methodology to different things. And I think um, it doesn't always need the most wonderful part of de design, I think, is that it doesn't always need a designer to do it. You can be a researcher or you can be a public health practitioner, a wildlife biologist, and you can use these existing case studies that are available, the way that people are using these methods to bring people together, understand the community beliefs, understand the community support that's needed and find those pain points yourself with the background that you come from. And I think bringing then the right people on board and the right stakeholders is very possible. So um, yeah, I think it's, it, it's very real and it can be done by a very transdisciplinary interdisciplinary approach. So we have one last question after which we'll wrap up. Uh, it's from Arun. A fascinating presentation and discussion. I would like to add a question along with Shraddha's view on bridging gaps. I'm keen to know your opinion on bridging gaps between traditional knowledge within generations of the same community. Yeah, okay, that's also a really wonderful question. Um, when I was doing this project, I was trying to understand which route to take, whether I was, like when I did the research, I was wondering if I should look at different generations of a family or a tribe and look at the gaps that exist there where kind of oral histories have either deteriorated or strengthened particular beliefs or whether I would focus on the education system. I chose the latter because I think the former requires in-depth community immersion and it requires a much deeper understanding of a particular place. Um, in terms of my opinion on bridging this gap, I think it's, it's something that is needed. It's something that even in today's society, whether it's rural or urban or hyper-modern, we are facing this everywhere there is a huge disparity that exists between generations about the values of certain things about the way that people perceive life the way that we understand family or uh, social space or public space personal space and i think all of these can be brought together as through discourse and that can be created by an engaging experience so a lot of these can be addressed through workshops and collective uh, community engagement practices and habits so the way that I would do it would be to host a particular discussion or a seminar like we're doing right now to share beliefs, to share uh, histories through drawing or participation. And I think that would be the starting point for it because it's something that is very much a long-term conversation. It requires maybe years of reinforcement and practice and uh, that would be possible then. Cool. So we have uh, one last question from Chandan, who is the field biologist of Pakke, and he's joining in from Pakke today. And he uh, says, wonderful presentation, Arita, and thanks for sharing the link. Uh, it's more like a comment on there is wildlife conflict, which is gradually increasing between humans and elephants. Can something be done on the above said issue? Uh, so Chandan, this is something that Arjun Kamdar 
is going to cover in the next few weeks. So I would actually encourage you to join the next uh, talk on um, conservation behavior. Uh, and Arjun has worked in uh, worked in the landscape of which uh, in Sonai Rupai and around, of which Pake is also a part. Um, and we would dis we'd be very happy to discuss that. And if there's anybody else here who would like to join the Seed Lab talk series, uh, because we have a variety of uh, practitioners, designers, and others who are here today, please email us at seedlabindia at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, once again, thank you, Adira. And thanks, everybody, uh, for being here. Uh, and we hope to see you soon and we hope to take this work forward as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Fascinating work, Arira, Nandini, Shraddha and all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant.